in session four, we had a problem, a technical problem with a, a power outage. And because of that, the recording got switched uh, to someone else's uh, settings other than mine. So what we're doing here is we're rereading the text itself, uh, having the text as a visual. That didn't happen in the last one. So this one you can read through with Ward and the readers and hopefully see it better. There's no commentary. This is a straight read through of the first talk to the boys. Jay Baba. Okay. Here we go. This is the first of the talks to the boys. Kayamat or Mahapralaya. How is the universe created? There are, there are innumerable universes interwoven with each other as indicated under item two in figure one above. So innumerable indeed are these universes that they cannot be counted even by so, so I'm sorry, even by realized beings like Sri, who with Maharaj once tried to do so. Okay, why don't you read That's both of those good. notes? Kayamat is the Islamic term for judgment day or doomsday, which warn about, which much warned about in the Quran, Mahapralaya is the cosmic dissolution that comes to pass at the end of the cycles of the Yugas. As this is explained in the Puranas and other Hindu literature. In this talk, Baba seems to assert an equivalence between these two rel religious eschatological ideas. During the early Meherabad period, the Mandabali the Mandali and other close followers often referred to Meher Baba as Sri, an honorific prefix often attached to the names of great men or deities. Here and in the episode narrated below, Meher Baba is referring to an occasion in 1921 when Baba was secluded with Ma Upasni Maharaj in Maharaja's Jokti hut in his ashram in Sakuri. Oh no, that's fine. Yeah, go ahead. So let's let's take a quick look at this figure. Um, no, I might shrink it for a second if I could. It'll be a little. Um, you see below the source figure. Uh, we found our manuscripts had just there was a blank for a figure in all of them, but just this one appeared, and what we took this to mean is this is the eye of the Sadhguru in the story that follows. That would be uh, Baba and Upasana Maharaj. They're going to narrate this story. Um, counting the universes. So all those little dots, each of those is a universe. We're not talking about stars. We're not talking about worlds. We're not talking about galaxies. We're talking about universes. He definitely says that. So that's going to be one of the themes that will come up later in the book. So uh, when Nod, you know, redrew it, you can see the eye there is Baba's eye, and he's counting all universes with Maharaj in the story. It's about to be related. These two words, Kiyamat and Mahapralaya, as said in the footnotes, if you read the Quran, which was the angel Gabriel's dictation to Muhammad, according to the traditional Islamic narrative. Um, Kiyamat is, or we, you could call it doomsday, if you wanted to use the English kind of negative term for it, day of judgment, is a, a very, very central theme. It's constantly uh, harped on, uh, warnings about it, and uh, particularly in the uh, earlier Suras. And Baba here is correlating it with Mahapralaya, which is the dissolution of the universe that occurs after 14 billion years. So Baba is using those terms synonymously. Okay. I'm going to keep going. It is quite strange that those that through, I'm sorry, it is quite strange that though these chains of innumerable universes continually emanate, issue forth 
from Sadhguru, who absorbs and eats them up. Again, they cannot be counted. This fact was proven one night at Sukhori when Sri and Maharaj, sitting in Maharaj Jopti, were talking about the subject of calculating the number of universes. Both of them, each in turn, tried to carry out the experiment. The first to make the attempt was Maharaj. Now to calculate and fix the exact number of universes, universes which flow in a regular chain continually without a moment's intermission, one has actually to stop the flow in order to check and come up as many universes as possible. But this cannot be done, and there are reasons for it. For some slight trouble, <laughs> as caused by this attempt to flow, to stop the flow, the trouble arises due to the concentrating of one's mind and whole force on that one point alone. All thoughts center around, center around this one issue, and this act of concentrating for the sake of stopping the flow of universes in order to count them causes and precipitates duality, plurality from unity, unity being the state of the realized one. This causing and precipitating of duality may sometimes prove fatal to the physical gross body, which cannot stand the strain. And so the body may even have to be dropped in a tense moment. It was for this reason that Maharaj checked Sri Baba in his efforts to stop the chain and count the universes, as this attempt would endanger the very life of the physical body of Sri, as explained above. Indeed, as Maharaj said, no one has ever succeeded, not even the perfect masters. And why not? For the reason explained above, that's Svayambhu. Svayambhu, the self-originating reality, starts from the masters. What an interesting phrase. And if it were stopped for the purpose of counting, this attempt would cause and proliferate dualism, and so much trouble would ensue that the very life itself, physical existence, would fall into prey, into peril. So, <clears throat> as said, Events actually did play out like this with Shri's own gross body once, when in a tense moment in the course of trying to count the universes, his physical body came into danger so that Maharaj had to step in at once to, attempt, to halt the attempt and stop the process. You want to pick up there, Alan? Now, once the universes emanate from a Sadguru, once they come out from him, after many ages, they are taken in again. But though they, re but though they really have gone in, been absorbed, disappeared from the standpoint of the outside, they really are there on the inside, though they have... reverted to the state of the imagination, Kalpana, Bas, Brahm. And those words are here, yeah. Kalpana means an idea, an imagining, a whim. Bas means illusion. Brahm designates perplexity, confusion, delusion, wandering in the mind. All are Gujarati words. In Hindu mythology and cosmology. Yeah, wait a second on that. That'll come up in a minute. Oh, all right. Later in the paragraph, yeah. Baba liked those words when he would dictate in Gujarati, particularly bas. Bas is one of his favorite words, and Brahm comes up a fair bit. Kalp kalpana is a little bit unusual for him. And he, um, so the, the universe is reverted to the state of the imagination, Kalpana, Bas, Brahm, and hence they have become useless, yet they are there. In due course, from the inside, they emanate, 
they come out again until eventually they pass through their universal rounds of Mahapralaya and get swallowed up once more and so on and on and on. And here's Mahapralaya, the oh, in Hindi, in, in Hindu mythology and cosmology, Mahapralaya is the annihilation of the universe at the end of an age or Kalpa. Pralaya, as referenced below, is a lesser form of annihilation, occurring more frequently and with less severity. In this talk, Meher Baba associates pralaya with the annihilation on an individual scale that occurs when a person goes to sleep. Okay, so Baba's about to go into that. As a parallel case, consider your own state in sound sleep. When you are unconscious of your body, of your own existence, and even of the world and universe, we call this a kind of pralaya, a being taken and turning and entering within. But when you awake again, all that you had absorbed becomes conscious and re-emerges. This is the pralaya of the coming out again, and so on and so on. This pralaya of being taken and going within, and in due course coming out again, transpires on the individual level. But when it occurs for a realized one, we're dealing with the universal case. And when all the universes get absorbed within and projected out, we call this great event Maha Pralaya. And so to review, Pralaya happens every day. For the ordinary human being, when he reverts to sound sleep on an individual scale, and for the realized one, when that sleep occurs on the universal level, so it is said in the Quran that on the day of resurrection, Quiamat, they will all rise up from their respective graves. This, a f yeah. this yeah. major Qur Quranic theme is expressed in several places, in including Quran 22, 6 through 7, which reads in English translation, that is because God is the truth, and because he gives life to the dead, and because he is powerful over all things, and because the hour is coming in which there is no doubt, and because God will resurrect whoever is in the graves. See, we can, sk we can skip okay. all this bibliographic stuff. Uh, anyone right. who wants to dig that up can you do so. so hmm. Yeah. Okay. And um, this figure uh, is associated with this discussion. We could read... Um, why don't we read those two paragraphs and then look at the figure? Three God states. Now, to come to the real point of explanation, mark the following three states of God as shown in figure two. Take note of God in state B, where he becomes creator, preserver, and destroyer of the universe, Shristi. This God state B, poor fellow, though he knows to create, preserve, and destroy the universe, yet he knows this is this only and does not know himself. So let's take a look at that figure. This, this poor fellow is Ishwar, the creator, preserver, destroyer of the universe. <laughs> the Christian creator God. So um, actually... <laughs> Uh, there was no figure in the source. It was missing, even though it got referred to uh, by saying in B and A and so forth. So uh, we conceived the diagram, this diagram, it seemed clearly to be expressing this. So A there 
is God in the I am God state, God knowing himself. Uh, I guess that would be beyond state to be for people who are knowledgeable about the 10 states of God chapter. And B is what he was just talking about, the poor fellow who creates, preserves, and destroys, but does not have the I am God experience. He does not know himself. This is a point that Baba made in Infinite Intelligence, God Speaks, and all throughout. In that state, God does not have self-knowledge, although he's the Lord of the universe. And C is the Jivatma. If you're not acquainted with that word, it would be a good one to become familiar with. Atma means soul, and Jiv is like living or live or bound, a bound soul in bondage. Soul in bondage is the meaning of it. So these are all jivatmas, individual jivatmas. So the key, all of these figures have keys. Um, so do you want to read that, the key, Alan? Can you see it okay? Key to figure two. In figure two, state B, or creator, preserver, destroyer, finds its home on a single point that is the ohm point. In this state, you can, you can see it right there, right? There's B. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting. Hmm. Yeah. In this state, which infinite intelligence calls Ishvar, and God speaks the third state of God, God does not possess self knowledge. The Jivatmas in C are represented as bubbles with points at their centers representing the atma or true self at the core of the ignorant enslaved drop soul individuality so i uh, jumping in just to interrupt for a second so that you see this is how uh, nadia and i worked out to represent the jivatma it's a bubble but every bubble has a point and that point represents the atma or the reality within the every drop soul. That symbolism is going to recur in many of the drawings. Baba didn't give us that. We just came up with that as a way of expressing this idea. While you know, these two gra grammatic elements repeat in some of the figures that follow, figure two represents A, the original God state, as God conscious, whereas in some of the later figures, God is primordially unconscious. In the balloon analogy that immediately follows figure two, the man blowing into the balloon corresponds to state B, since he does not know himself and not to the God conscious state in A. <laughs> Do you want to read that part and then I'll pick okay. up when you get tired? Okay. Three God states. Now, to come to the real point of explanation, mark the following three states of God as shown in figure two, which we were just looking at, A, B, and C. Take note of God in state B where he becomes creator, preserver, and destroyer of the universe, Shrishti. See B right there? Yeah. This God in state B, poor fellow, <laughs> though he knows to create, preserve, and destroy the universe, yet he knows this only and does not know himself. Here, Shri evoked the simile of a balloon, Fugo into which a man blows air through his mouth with his eyes, Nazar, always turned outward in an opposite direction. That is, away from himself and toward the balloon as it increases in size, and hence he never sees or knows himself. Shri continued. In C, God is Jeev, bound in his bindings, bandhan. You see, see there, those are all jeeves, little drop souls. In B, as we have seen, 
God is the creator, preserver, and destroyer of the universe, but he does not know self. You see B there. That's like the man with the balloon who sees the balloon but doesn't see himself. In A, God has the experience of I am God, I am Anand, I am all bliss. And the footnote reads, Abba does not intend to designate the beyond, beyond state of God, the first of the 10 states of God and God speaks, since in that state, God is unconscious, but rather, fana fila, that, it, that part of the beyond state of God that God speaks designates as to be. And then see uh, God speaks, the references there. Actually, in 2b, God experiences God's trio nature of knowledge, power, and bliss, whereas in state A, God experiences only bliss, as the soul does who achieves mukti. The point is, God in state A remains unconscious of the universe and can provide no help to those jivatmas lost in it. It is perhaps for this reason that later in this talk, Baba includes A among those states that have no meaning or worth. Okay, there's a little uh, reference to God Speaks. Um, continuing on, in all of these, A, B, and C, God remains one and the same, but in C, poor fellow, God is caught in the binding, the chief state. And in B, Though he serves as the universe's creator, preserver, and destroyer, he enjoys not the knowledge of self. Only in state A does he experience the I am God state. In short, why do all these troubles afflict God in his various states? This happens because in the beginning, God does not know self. And to come to this knowledge, all these troubles follow, and it is necessary and essential that they should. Okay, I'll skip that note. Do you want to read, Cassandra? Sure. Let's take an example. Everything around you, you see with your eyes. Suppose while looking at something in particular, while seeing that something, suddenly the idea comes to you, I must see the actual eyes that see all these things. Toward that end, you make efforts by reflecting on the problem, by reading and hearing what others say. And thus you come to know that what you can see, come to know that you can see your own eyes if you look into a mirror. To fulfill your purpose then, you need to pr procure a mirror, a looking glass. You proceed to pay a visit to a shopkeeper and ask him for a mirror. The shopkeeper has a mirror in stock, but he demands money in payment for its cost. You extend yourself to get the money from wherever you can. And when you manage to accomplish this, you render it to the shopkeeper who gives you the mirror desired. Then you can actually see your own eyes in the mirror. And when you have done so, your object having been accomplished and your purpose served, you throw the mirror away, or let us say, set it aside, since it has no further use. In this analogy, the shopkeeper may be compared to the Satguru. The money may be compared to love for the Satguru. And the mirror may be compared to the grace of the master. Guru Krupa. So try, try all of you to earn money with which you may procure the mirror from the Sadguru. That is, create love for the Sadguru, and in return, he will give you the mirror, power of sight, with which you can see your own eyes, that is to say, the soul or self. In short, these states have no meaning or worth. Only three things are of real worth and worthy of consideration. God, Sadhguru, and love. And the fun of it is, 
all three of these are one and the same. So once again, boys, try to create love within you. Real and sincere love for God, that is, for the Guru, so that the Guru may show you Paramatma. And the sub or the uh, footnote state one has no meaning or worth, presumably, since it remains aloof from creation and renders no assistance to the bound ones or bandhas, such as the Merashram boys listening to this talk. For such spiritual help, they need to turn not to individualities in any of these straits, states, but to the guru. Oh, Melissa's here just in time to read. <laughs> Good morning. I can even read the um, footnotes by pulling the window over, as you suggested, and putting on my close-up glasses. Okay. Who is greater? Who is greater, Muhammad or Allah? Muhammad, of course. Who is greater, Krishna or Brahma? Again, the same answer, Krishna. Yes, this is a fact. Yet, do not speak about this to others in the world unless you, unless and until you see, know, and experience it for yourself. Otherwise, you will put yourselves in a cauldron of troubles, all for naught, I'm guessing, all for nothing. Mm. Yet this remains a fact beyond doubt. God is one, while bandas or slaves are innumerable. Banda karodo che. When banda. And that means. Uh, bound ones are tens of millions. Karodo is the Gujarati plural of karod, which in the Indian numeric system means 10 million. In India, everybody knows crores is the usual word. When Banda becomes one, he is Kuda, and Kuda is one. Kuda ekche as Hafez has said in one of his poems. You want me to go down and read 15? No, that's, um, that's an end note. So we, we're at the end notes we skip. Oh, okay, sorry. Just the footnotes. There, therefore, until such time as you see God yourself, know that you are still Banda. And in that imperfect state, if you declare, I am God, you are a kafir, an infidel, indeed. As another analogy, Sri related the story of a mad beggar who always used to shout, I am the king. And when he did, all the bystanders used to laugh. But if King George were to proclaim this, no one would laugh. But to the contrary, all would believe him. For he is that, the king, indeed. Then the footnote, for, yeah. King George V, from 1865 to 1936, was monarch of England and nominal ruler of the British Empire from 1910 until his death. India, of course, was a part of the British Raj at this time. <clears throat> As another analogy, Sri related the story of a mad beggar who always used to shout, I am the king. I'm sorry, I started at the wrong spot. It's all right, just keep going. And when he did, all the bystanders used to laugh. But if King George were to proclaim this, no one would laugh. But to the contrary, all would believe him, for he is that, the king, indeed. Or again... If the same madman were taken to the throne in the inner sanctum of the royal palace and seated there with crown on his head, enthroned and crowned thus, he could truly declare, I am king, but not until then. So suppose, Shri continued, 
in an intoxication, in a sort of madness, one becomes, one believes oneself to be a king, well and good. But when he comes back to his senses, then he has to bear a great strain. Sri went on. So try then, try to see God. And when you have succeeded, boldly assert, I am God. In truth, you are so already. You are God. But you need to see it for yourself. How? By seeking out, placing yourself in front of and listening to the one who has actually seen, experienced, and united with God, and by doing as he says. And what does Sri, like any realized being, ask and desire of you? Only Prem. Prem and more Prem. And a so you like the things read right there. I kind of like them at the end of the paragraph, but I'll read you think it. That you think that'd be better? It could be done either way. I think it interrupts it less. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. As the person doing the storytelling, that's how <laughs> it feels. Yeah. Only Prem. Prem and more Prem. And Asad Guru is the very living personification of Prem. So keep on thinking thinking and thinking continually of your guru. Go on creating prem for him and desiring prem in return, and you shall get it. Om. Love, prem is love in the Indic languages. Over the next few months, as the prem that Baba was calling for here had indeed awakened among the schoolboys, Baba established what he called the Prem Ashram. Very good. Okay, that's that one. Yeah, onward and upward. <laughs>